That song we just sang truly is our prayer this morning, church. We want to see God's kingdom built here among us. And that's a prayer that has been prayed by the people of God for centuries. And the story we're going to read today as we continue this series in Matthew called Come Near is God's answer to that prayer request. That God might build his kingdom here on earth. Jesus goes about that business in our story this morning. Let's read together. This is Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Let's pray together. Father, more than anything, we want to become aware this morning once again of the presence of your Son among us, yielding our hearts to him. For some of us, we have heard his call long ago and set out to follow him. Others of us may yet be waiting to hear that call. But wherever we are, our prayer is that we sense that you have come near among us once again, among your people whom you love, that you might transfigure us with your own glory, changing us from the inside out, in a way that only you are capable of. And we pray this in the name of that one you sent to call us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, up to this point in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has been walking through the story of Israel, but in reverse. It's it's like he put the rewind tape on the story of Israel. Because we've heard the story of him being baptized in the Jordan. The Jordan River was where Israel crossed over into the promised land, out of the wilderness. But what we hear in Matthew is Jesus has gotten into the water of the Jordan, and rather than entering the promised land, he leaves the promised land and enters the wilderness. He spends 40 days there in prayer and fasting where he's tested by Satan. And then after that time, we come to our story today, and Matthew tells us he departs to Capernaum, and he describes Capernaum with the words of Isaiah, Galilee of the Gentiles, which is a really weird way to describe Galilee, because Galilee was not mostly full of Gentiles. It was mostly full of Jews, just like Jesus 
But Isaiah describes Galilee as Galilee of the Gentiles because in Isaiah's time, it was Gentiles who were calling the shots in that area. It was Gentiles who were ruling over the Jews in Galilee. And nothing has changed, really, in Jesus' own time. It is still the Gentiles who are lording it over the Jews there in Galilee. And so, yes, the population is mostly Jewish, but it's the Gentiles who are in charge. And so what we find is Jesus continues the rewind button. He's left the promised land, crossed the Jordan, gone through the wilderness, and now he finds himself in Egypt. This land overrun and ruled by foreign power. And he comes into this place declaring that he brings another kingdom. He comes as a new Moses. He has his own work in which he wants to set his people free. And the first step in all of that is to gather a people. He comes as a new Moses looking for the people of God. And he starts with four fishermen. That's where this people begin to be gathered, with four fishermen on a lake answering this call. And everything about the calling of these four fishermen is weird. There's nothing about it that really makes sense. Uh, To start, it's Jesus who is calling them, this teacher, this rabbi, who is calling and finding disciples. That's not the way it was supposed to work. It was supposed to work the other way. If you're a rabbi, what you want is for students to come and find you. That meant you had something to offer. People wanted to come and spend time with you, to learn from you, sit at your feet. And Jesus reverses this. Instead of students coming to him in this first moment, no, he, he goes and finds some students. It would be like, instead of applying to Harvard, Harvard went out and tried to find students and begged them to come, and fo- come to school there. It's completely in reverse, so that's, that's weird. It's also weird that he chooses fishermen. These guys who spend their time out on boats, pulling in fish, cleaning those fish, finding merchants who can sell these fish so that they can survive another day. This is not who you would expect Jesus to go and find. You might expect him to go to find some Pharisees, these people who spend their lives searching the scriptures, trying to download it into their souls so they can know God better. Go out and find a few good Pharisees. Or maybe you'd expect him to go find some zealots, and eventually he does. There is Simon the zealot that becomes a disciple, but these fishermen are not zealots. They're not hungry for revolution, ready to overthrow the Gentile overlords they're now serving. And they're not like John the Baptist out in the desert, these holy men spending their days in prayer and fasting, trying to come to know and experience the God of Israel. It's none of those things. Jesus doesn't pick them for their academic rigor, for their depth of spirituality or their political leanings. Picks four fishermen. But even stranger than that, stranger than the fact that Jesus calls them, stranger than the fact that these are fishermen that he called, is also their response. Their response makes absolutely no sense. It is bizarre and inexplicable that Peter, Andrew, James, and John would drop everything to follow this man. In fact, it's so confusing that we've often tried to fill in the gaps. Matthew doesn't give us a whole lot of detail here. Jesus just shows up, he calls them, and they drop everything, and they follow. And we, we try to fill in the gaps to make it make sense, to make their decision a rational one. Well, maybe he, they already knew him. They, 
They had maybe heard about him from other places. Maybe they had witnessed a few miracles that just aren't recorded yet. Maybe it was such an honor to be approached by this rabbi that they were willing to drop everything so that they could maybe be a part of what he was doing, to be students of this well-known rabbi, get in on the ground floor. But Matthew doesn't give us any of that. And I think that's intentional. Because I think what he wants us to pay attention to is not the faith of these disciples, these first disciples, the faith of these fishermen. What I think he wants us to pay attention to is the greatness of Christ. The one who can show up out of nowhere and upend your life, whose beauty is so captivating that you would drop everything, your livelihood, family that raised you, full-time paycheck, let go of all of it. Because there is so, something so enrapturing about the presence of Christ. That's what the disciples meet in that moment. And it's not the first time or the last time that this will happen in the course of the Gospels. The story of Scripture is this story where people meet Christ. They come into the presence of Christ and everything is changed. There is Peter, our story today, and there's also Paul. There's Lazarus. And there's Legion. There's the woman at the well and the thief on the cross. From start to finish, the gospel is the story of Jesus encountering people. And when they come into the presence of Christ, they find it so alluring that they just drop everything to continue being in that presence, to be close to him, the one who has come near to them. And do you know what the Bible calls that response to Jesus? It's the word that Jesus uses in his own preaching, repentance. So often when we think about repentance, what we typically think about is feeling guilty or bad about some sin in our lives. Or maybe if we take it a step above that, we think about stopping that sin, that repentance really means changing your action. And both of those things are true. Those are both pieces of repentance. But I think the primal thing that makes repentance repentance is an encounter with Christ. That repentance is a response to the beauty of Christ. The Hebrew word that we get repentance from, shuv, is to turn, which means you are both turning away from something and also turning towards something. Repentance is picking this new focal point that you can aim your life at. And the thing we want to aim at, the thing that the disciples want to aim at, is Christ. There is something so beautiful about Christ that I'm willing to turn away from everything I knew before to turn and face him. It's like the parables that Jesus tells later on in the Gospels about that treasure buried in a field. Someone comes across it and they sell everything they own so that then they can go buy the field and then pull out the treasure. Repentance is not just about selling everything you own, getting rid of all those past entanglements. It's because you found treasure. There's something so worth it here that you would change everything before Give up whatever hinders you so you can have this thing. And that's the Christ that these four fishermen meet. The Christ that is so enrapturing, so beautiful that they just find themselves loosening their grip on their nets. So they have to be near him. So they met Jesus and they repented for the beauty of him. And then Jesus sends them out to do the same thing, to, 
to recreate that same experience for others. He tells them, I want you to go. I'm going to make you fishers of people. You were fishing for fish, but now I want you to take that same logic and apply it now in this arena of life. I want you to catch people. And I am admittedly a horrible fisherman. Uh, In fact, I have never eaten a fish that I have caught, mostly because you have to catch a fish before you can eat it. But I got into fly fishing when we moved to Arkansas. We, I knew there were rivers around there that people fly fished on, and I was desperate to go try fly fishing. And I was desperate to try fly fishing for the same reason every man in this room wants to try fly fishing. You saw the movie, A River Runs Through It, right? And I wanted to be Brad Pitt out there on the river. <laughs> you know, casting my reel. That's what I was picturing. And so I, I found this older minister in the church I was working at, and he fly fished all the time. And I said, would you take me out? And he, he took me up to Missouri, about an hour away from where we were living, this place called Roaring River State Park. And he picked it out because there's a fish hatchery at the top of the river, and so they just let fish down. It's perfect for a newbie like me. And he taught me how to fly fish. He tried to teach me how to fly fish. And cast that reel out. And we'd spend hours out there on the river, and he would catch dozens of fish. I would catch a couple. And I want to show you this picture. This is, the, this is my first fish ever to catch fly fishing. I was so excited. And I think this is the image often we get when we hear Jesus' invitation, this call to be fishers of people. We can't help but picture that rod and reel catching one fish at a time. But that's not the kind of fishing that Jesus has in mind here. That's not the kind of fishing that these fishermen were doing. No, you know, they were throwing out these huge, gigantic nets. They'd pull up not one fish at a time, not even a dozen fish at a time. If they were lucky, if it was a good day, be hundreds of fish at a time. And that's the image Jesus is leaning into, this kind of indiscriminate net casting. You don't know what's going to be pulled up out of the water. You're not looking for a specific species or a specific size of fish. You cast your nets and see what comes, what comes up. It's the way Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven even later in Matthew uh, chapter 12, 13. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. They sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets and threw it, threw the others away, the bad away. That's the picture Jesus is painting. Who knows what's going to end up in this net? And we'll sort it out later, but we cast, cast these nets. That's a beautiful picture, I think, for the work of the gospel, this work of proclaiming the kingdom of God. Because what Jesus is inviting us to do is to invite people into the same thing we've experienced with Christ ourselves. Do you know what the net is in the kingdom of heaven? You know what functions as the net? It's Christ. Christ is our net. Christ is the one who captures the human soul. And that's why so many people come and follow Jesus. In that next paragraph, right after he's called the disciples, all kinds of people show up. They cast the net of Christ. They hear about this rabbi who is teaching and healing, saying the kingdom is near They're enraptured by it. All kinds of people show up. Paralyzed. Those with seizures. Those with diseases. It's all kinds of people. They show up just to be near Christ because Christ is the net. Christ is the one that ensnares us. That when we meet him, when we come into his presence, we find ourselves loosening the grip on everything else we used to think mattered. The things we used to hold so tightly to in the presence of Christ, oh, 
and they fade away. Christ is our net. And I think it's important for us to remember that. Because we're living in a time where the anxiety about the number of fish we're catching is going up. It can cause all kinds of different strategies to come into place when the church starts worrying about the number of fish are in the nets. Some people want to take up spearfishing. You know those Christians. Others want to just throw dynamite in the lake, see what happens, see what floats up. But regardless of the strategy, there is a temptation to lose sight of what the net actually is. What is actually, what are we actually using to catch people? If we're going to be fishers of people, we cannot forget that it is Christ that is the net. That is what we offer the world. That is what the church exists for. That people, the people whom God created and whom he deeply loves might come into the presence of the utterly beautiful one. Their lives might be disrupted in the best kinds of ways. I don't know if you've been paying attention to some of the news going on in Kentucky lately. Uh, There's a revival that's broken out in Asbury University And there's kind of lots of debate going on. It all started with a chapel service. I remember my days at ACU going to chapel, and I would have been very surprised if a revival started at chapel. You kind of swipe your card, and you might get a buddy to swipe your card for you so you didn't have to go. I mean, a lot of people didn't really want to be there. But at Asbury, a chapel, revival's broken out. And, And for days, I think it's still going on. This started like two weeks ago. And there's some pictures of it. Students are still meeting there. And like I said, there's some debate here. Like, people are watching this, and there's always a good question to ask about, you know, is this genuine? Is this really the work of the Holy Spirit? We want to discern the Spirit here. I think that's important work. And at the same time, I am hearing stories from what's going on there that I think are good. One of them was the story about the administration getting a phone call from a very well-known worship leader. Someone, they didn't say the name, but I got the sense that we would all know who this was. And he said, look, I, I, I love what's going on there. How, how can I help? And you hear what's behind that question, right? How can, how can I come and help you? How can I offer my services? And of course, he's probably thinking, I'm going to be on that stage because I know how to lead groups like this. I know how to start a revival, keep it going. I'm gifted at what I do. And do you know what the administration said in response to that? You're welcome to come and worship with us. But the students are going to be leading worship. Why? I think it's out of this commitment that says it is the presence of Christ we are after. It is the presence of Christ that matters. It is not the celebrity on the stage. It's not how many fish we can draw to whatever event. It is whether the presence of Christ is here. And if it is, we protect that at all costs because that is why we're here. It is Christ we want to meet. Christ that can change our lives. Christ that can reshape our world as he calls us into his kingdom work, a kingdom that upends every other kingdom that suppresses and oppresses people, a kingdom, the kingdoms of the world that constantly belittle us and dehumanize us. Jesus comes into the picture and says, that is over. A new kingdom has come near. Come to me. Cast the net, church. The net of Christ, whose beauty enraptures and heals the human soul. That's our task. And as we close today, I want to share this prayer with you. Uh, it's a prayer I found this week that just it fits so perfectly. These were the words I think we need to pray together. And so I, I want to invite you to speak these words with me. Read them with me as we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, the privilege is ours to share in the loving, healing 
reconciling mission of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in this age and wherever we are. Since without you we can do no good thing, may your Spirit make us wise. May your Spirit guide us. May your Spirit renew us. May your Spirit strengthen us so that we will be strong in faith, discerning in proclamation, courageous in witness, persistent in good deeds. This we ask in the name of the Father. The church says, amen. amen. Let me pray over us as as we invite the praise team back up. Father, these words that we've just prayed, would you make it so among us? by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the presence through that Spirit of your Son, Jesus Christ. May all the good things that you wish to pour out over all of humanity, over all of creation, may we take part in that. May we find small ways and great ways to find ourselves caught up in your work in the world. Enrapture us again, our God. Meet us where our souls are, whether they are far from you or near. Find us. Capture us in your net that you might draw us into your boat and save us from the whirling waters around us. And teach us how we can contribute to that same work ourselves. Casting the net of Christ. That others might experience your presence as well. Might come to know you as as we have begun to know you. To your glory and to our good, we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.